I asked you all to watch this short video. It was not very long for the first 12 slides or so. I'm going to briefly highlight some structures that you definitely want to keep a mind mm -hmm. of, especially for lab. Uh, when we're talking about the urinary system, our main focus is the kidneys, but they are not the only part of the urinary system. We also have the ureters and the urinary bladder, and I'll talk about those later today. The kidneys do a lot for your body, a lot. And in fact, in physiology, it takes me a good three weeks to get through all of their functions. And that's not just in lecture, but also in lab. They are endocrine glands. They help regulate your blood volume and pressure, not just the salt and water content in your plasma, but also the red blood cell count. If you have kidney failure, your, or if you or a patient of yours has kidney failure, they will eventually become anemic because the kidneys are the primary site to make erythropoietin to sustain the red blood cell count. The liver is the secondary site and it does not make enough erythropoietin to sustain a typical red blood cell count. So the kidneys do a lot, and they have, a, they have an overall function that we learn about in physiology. And it's an equation. It's E equals F plus S minus R. And E stands for excretion. F stands for filtration, S minus, uh, stands for secretion, and R stands for reabsorption. At the glomerulus, that is where you're going to have filtration, and in the video I told you about the filtration membrane. It's very similar to the respiratory membrane that you've already learned a couple of units ago. Then all throughout the nephron, the structure here, we have the other two functions, secretion and reabsorption. Secretion means something, this is my blood vessels here, these dashed red lines. Something in the plasma that escaped filtration is now put in the lumen, so that's called secretion. If something is taken out of the filtrate and put back into the bloodstream, that's called reabsorption. At the end of all three processes, what comes out in your urine is dictated by the upstream processes of filtration, secretion, and reabsorption. And that's how your kidneys help uh, create different kinds of urine. You do create different kinds of urine. I'm sure you've seen your pee. Does it look very different in the morning? Mm -hmm. It should then throughout the day if you're very well hydrated. Does your urine look very water-like, as if you could drink it again if you wanted to, though you shouldn't? Or does it look the color of Dana's jacket? Because if it looks like Dana's jacket, you are not well hydrated. You need to drink some more water. We spend a lot of time in physiology learning about these functions, and there are mathematical equations that go along with that main equation. And we teach our students how to calculate renal function. We teach you how to calculate if your patient is in renal failure. No nurse ever has to do that. The laboratory does that. All we have to do is collect blood and urine and we could figure out if you have renal failure. It's not hard though to learn the equations and if you learn the equations, then you know what the results mean. You know how they got them. And that is very powerful. And I'll give you an example of why you care if you take physiology here when we abuse you with these calculations called renal clearance values. Uh, not too long ago, well, I guess it's been about 10 years ago now-ish, my honey, being very healthy, he goes in for a yearly checkup, gets his blood and urine analysis done, just like most of you do. Do you go in for yearly checkups and you get your blood and urine analysis done? Well, it's a good idea. Anyway, so he got his results and they came back abnormal. His creatinine 
was increased beyond normal limits. He also had an increase in potassium. Potassium, if you remember from lecture unit two, is supposed to be found inside cells, not so much outside. His plasma levels were elevated for, for potassium. So he had elevated potassium, elevated creatinine, and he had elevated conjugate, unconjugated bilirubin. And unconjugated bilirubin comes from destruction of red blood cells. It's supposed to be converted into something called conjugated bilirubin by the liver. So the doctor called him and said, you need to come back, we need to repeat. So Chris went back and they repeated the, the tests. And they came back, same three things, elevated. So then the doctor said, well, here, take this container. I want a 24-hour urine specimen. And have any of you had to do a 24-hour urine specimen? OK, Ali, do you have your water bottle? Hold it up for me. OK, now imagine five of those. One big white container. Five of those are big. And Chris had to take that everywhere with him and capture every last drop of urine, every last drop, and store it in the refrigerator when he wasn't peeing it. Pee is sterile. It's not like he's sprinkling it in the refrigerator. Can't it's you, like missing a little bit and then like, you know, like you wipe it down. <laughs> and it's a big hole. I mean, I'd be more worried if it were female, right? Because then there's probably a, spl a splash zone. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm coming downstairs for work, and Chris meets me at the bottom of the stairs, and he says, I have some news for you. I said, okay. He said, well, my 24-hour specimen came back, same thing, elevated creatinine, elevated unconjugated bilirubin, and elevated potassium. And he said the doctor, the doctor's office called and said, I need to go in for a liver and kidney biopsy because they suspect I have liver and renal failure. And I looked at him, and in my head, I thought, how could this be? He's the epitome of health. And then another thought came through my head of, I'm going to hit him over the head, grab him by his ankles, and take him to the hospital because if they think he has liver and renal failure, we don't have the luxury of waiting for a biopsy. We're going now. So then the third person came in my head and said, be logical about this. Don't take his word for it. Ask him for the data. So I said, do you have your results? I need to see him. He said, yeah, sure. He brings me the little envelope with the results. And I quickly open them, and I'm looking at him. So I take them with me to work, and at stoplights, I'm looking at it. I'm like, yep, elevated potassium, elevated creatinine, elevated unconjugated bilirubin, and I'm crying. Because I, I mean, it is suggestive of hepatic and renal failure, and I'm crying all the way to work. It was a Wednesday, and I show up for work at the old building. That's where we were teaching at the time. And this particular class, I had a lot of ex-military medics lot of military in this particular section for fizz and I'm trying to unlock the door and I'm, I'm just I'm just crying I'm a mess and ex-military medics most of them were you know male in this section they don't do well with a crying female they really don't and I remember Kevin McCarthy this big guy he always greeted me the same way he went you're there. <laughs> It'll be okay. <laughs> so I, did. I unlocked the door. I was like, gentlemen, asses in seats, let's go. And I had just taught them renal clearance values. I had just taught them. I said, here's some real data. Same data that you look at. What do you think of this? They looked at the data and they said, it doesn't look good. It looks like it's liver and renal failure. I said, it's my honey. It doesn't make sense. And they said, okay, what do you want to do? What, what, you know? I said, we're not doing lab. We're going to solve this puzzle. We're going to figure this out. There's another explanation. I know there is. I said, 
I've always told you there are two sides to every coin. There are two sides to every coin. The doctor is taking one side of the coin. Failure to get rid of those wastes, because that's what they are, waste. Failure to get rid of the waste. So the kidneys and liver are not getting rid of the waste. That is the doctor's perspective. And the guy said, okay, what's, what, what's our perspective? I said, source. Source, that's the other side of the coin. Something has to make them. What if whatever's making them is overdoing it? And the liver and kidneys are just fine. They're just being overworked. And this could be temporary. And they said, okay, challenge accepted. Let's go. So I divided them into thirds. I said, I want to know why cells can leak potassium. I want to know why we can have a lot of unconjugated bilirubin. I want to know why we can get a lot of creatinine. You all know the answer already, and let's think. And does it apply to his lifestyle? So the potassium people said, potassium is supposed to be intracellular, Kara. Cells can dump this out, especially skeletal muscle. That's called rhabdomyolysis. Week number two, you taught us that. I said, yep. Well, then what sort of muscle lysing is your husband having? I said, I have a theory. Hold on to that. I'll get back to you. Unconjugated bilirubin, what do you have? They said unconjugated bilirubin comes from macrophages destroying aged or dying or damaged red blood cells. I said, got it. They said, where is that coming from then? What, what source of aged, dying, damaged red blood cells does your honey have? I said, I got it. Plays soccer and he has a huge, huge hematoma which is a big ass bruise and a lot of soft tissue damage. Big bruise, a lot of blood damage. And they're like, okay, that makes sense. I said, the thing should be drained, it's that big. So they said, okay, that explains the unconjugated bilirubin. We still need to solve the potassium. I turned to the creatinine, I said, creatinine, where does it come from? They said, muscle metabolism. I said, okay. Muscle leaking, muscle metabolism. Oh, let me unite those. This guy, before he goes to the doctor, even though he's already healthy, he goes a little batshit crazy. Along the lines of if you're on a diet and you go to McDonald's and you get a Big Mac and a large fry, but because you're on a diet, a diet large Coke, because that'll offset everything. No. <laughs> Look at so like, yes, <laughs> no. So for him, before going to the doctor for a regular checkup, he ups his game. And he goes really crazy at the gym. He's already healthy, but he'll, go, he'll just be there for hours. I said, what if he's just do, doing really heavy weights for too long? There's your rhabdomyolysis, there's your potassium, and there's your creatinine. Boom. End of story. Source, not failure to remove. And they said, okay, so now what? I said, we're going to write it down. We're going to write a letter to the doctor because, because even though I have a PhD in molecular biology, my honey reads the science section in the newspaper. Therefore, he thinks he knows more than I do. <laughs> he won't believe me. He will not believe me. He'll say I'm being emotional and not logical. <laughs> And I think I'm being very logical. <laughs> so we wrote a letter. We itemized those three things. We basically said, source, not failure to remove problem. Ask him about X, Y, Z. Ask him about his workout routine before he goes to the doctor. Ask him about his soccer team and ask him to show you his large hematoma on his shin. Now those are most those questions are not your typical questions that a doctor will ask you. Hey, do you have a random hematoma I should know about that can skew your blood and urine work? No one says that. Hey, tell me about your batshit craziness, you know, attitude about going to the gym before you come see me. Those are not standard questions. So for the doctor to take the view of one side of the coin of failure to remove, I get it, I understand but there has to be a source. There's always a source. 
you have to look at both. So we wrote a letter, I brought it home, we taped it shut, and I, and the next day when he was going in for his biopsies, I said, here, if you don't want a liver and renal biopsy, you give the doctor this. This is your Hail Mary pass. <laughs> this is, there are 10 seconds left in the game. You're losing, my friend. Give your doctor this. So Chris went to the doctor, gave the note to him, and the doctor went, huh, okay, show me your hematoma. Chris shows it to him. That's a big hematoma, Chris. <laughs> why didn't you say anything? He's like, why? What are you going to do about it? He's like, that thing should be drained. <laughs> then he told Chris, you will not go work out for two weeks. You're not going to do anything. You're not going to play soccer. You're going to let that hematoma heal after I drain it. You're going to come back. We're going to repeat your blood and urine analysis lab. If your wife and her class are right, everything should go back to normal. Back to normal. Back to normal. And it was because we know how to evaluate renal function. The doctor doesn't do those equations. The doctor doesn't do, nurses don't do that. The labs just come back. And if you've had your urine and blood analysis done, you get pages of data, don't you? Pages of data. And one of the things on a page is EGFR. Estimated glomerular filtration rate. It is an assessment of how well your kidneys filter your blood, which should be filtered about 80 times a day. And if that is below a certain value for your age, your ethnicity, and your gender, you are in early stage renal failure. How many of you are over age 30? Congratulations, you're in early stage renal failure. Starting at age 30, you are entering 10% decline of renal function. For every decade after age 30, it's another 10% decline. If nothing else kills you in life, you will die of renal failure. So there you go. Now you know how you're gonna die if nothing else kills you. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> it's a good way to go. It's painless, it's painless. Your pH just goes to shit, you go into a coma and you're good. <laughs> so, you are clearly not in a class to learn about all of that function, but in order for you to appreciate all of those calculations, you need to know your anatomy. I don't have time to review the anatomy. This is fundamental. It, it, anatomy is a prereq, and I remind my students that all the time. Anatomy is a prereq. I don't have time to go over the parts of that one. You should know it. So I told you where we find our kidneys and how big they are, roughly the size of your fist. They are retroperitoneal. There's an outer layer to them. If we tag this outer layer and say, name this region, you say cortex. If we tag somewhere in the middle, anywhere here in the middle, and say, name this region, you say medulla. But if we say, name this structure, this triangle-shaped structure, if it's a structure, then whatever we're pinning, you identify whatever the pin is going through. You would say a renal pyramid. We also have columns, which are extensions of the cortex going in between the renal pyramids. And for every pyramid plus the surrounding column, that is a lobe. So this has six lobes. There is an indented region called the hilum, and this is where blood vessels can enter and exit, lymphatic vessels enter and exit, nerves enter and exit, and the renal pelvis and ureter exit at this point. So it's an indented. Where else do we see the hilum? Oh, that was good. The renal papilla are the point of these pyramids, and all of these these lines that you're seeing, these striations, are actually from these ducts going deep through the medulla. And the urine just drips, 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 drips out of the renal papilla into the minor calyces, which converge into major calyces, which converge into your renal pelvis, and then your ureter, which goes to your bladder. So 
So I told you about the renal pelvis and the calyces. Calyx is singular. There is a flow chart in your homework packet saying you are a waste molecule. I forget what I put, creatinine, urea, something like that. And those waste molecules travel in your blood, they go to the kidney, and they are freely filtered through the glomerulus. So I might ask you to flow chart getting to the kidney, all the blood vessels to get to the glomerulus, then be filtered, and then tell me every structure that waste molecule passes out until you pee it out of your body. Or I might say, just tell me the flow of blood to, through, and out of the kidney. So be mindful what the question asks you. If I tell you, tell me the pathway of a red blood cell to, through, and out of the kidney, then you're starting with the renal artery, you're listing all of these things, and you're exiting through the renal vein. You heard me say in the video that when it comes to veins, you don't have lobar veins or segmented veins. You just simply go straight from intralobar into the renal vein. So the first step for renal function is filtration. The glomerulus is a modified capillary bed. It has a lot of uh, fenestrations. And it also has pedicels from podocytes that wrap around. Pedicels are little feet extensions of the podocytes. And they create filtration slits. <coughs> so we have three layers to this filtration membrane. We have the simple squamous endothelium of the capillary bed. We then have a fused basement membrane, which is a sheet of protein. And then we have the podocytes on the, on the outside of them. That's the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. It provides the thinnest possible distance to filter your plasma as quickly as possible. And a lot of times students think that the reason why some items in your plasma are not filtered is because of a size exclusion, and that is not true. It is actually a charge exclusion. The basement membrane is proteins. Because of our pH in our body, 7.40, those proteins are negatively charged. The plasma proteins are also negatively charged. Same charges repel. If the basement membrane is compromised, then you will start to see very large proteins from your plasma leak out into your urine, and you will have protein urea. Do you have a very frothy urine? When you pee, is it like someone poured you a beer with a big head on it? Okay, good. <laughs> your, your urine should not be frothy like a freshly poured beer. It should not be. If you do, you should go to the doctor because you are having some items leak out through that basement membrane. There could be other reasons why, but you're going to want to get that assessed to find, figure out what's going on. That basement membrane becomes compromised. You have chronically high blood pressure and you don't get that under control. It also can become compromised if you have diabetes mellitus and you don't get that under control. Those two things will damage your kidneys and you will go into renal failure earlier than you should. So don't have chronically high blood pressure. Make sure you get your blood glucose levels tested regularly. All of you should be having a yearly checkup for blood and urine analysis. Also in my video, you heard about how many cortical nephrons we have and juxtamedullary nephrons. Most of them are very short loops of Henle, so that means most of our nephrons are cortical. If we flipped those, if we had 85% juxtamedullary nephrons, we would be able to drink seawater with impunity, but we cannot. And I will prove to you mathematically why we cannot drink seawater with impunity. And I will also prove to you why you should not drink your urine if you are lost somewhere and dehydrated. I don't care what Bear Grylls tells you. You don't drink your pee. You don't drink your pee. Yes. Will you want to say again why alkaline water is bad? Alkaline water is bad because your blood pH is already alkaline, slightly alkaline. It's not perfectly neutral. 7.40. Start to hyperventilate for me. No. 
That's panting. <laughs> Pretend you're blowing up your favorite inflatable toy. Don't tell me what that is, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Just start doing it for me. Don't ever try it for a porn. Just keep going. <laughs> you can hear some of my asthma. Can you hear it? <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> we won't judge. Are you feeling lightheaded yet? No. Then you're not breathing hard enough. Keep going till you feel fruit loopy. Okay, I don't feel good. <laughs> Blow out. Okay, now I feel lightheaded. Okay, that is alkalosis. That means your pH of your blood is too high. Just from you exit. I know. Now imagine feeling like that because you drank something that was alkaline. And how long is that going to be in your system until your kidneys get rid of it? So this is short-lived, isn't it? Yeah. You feel fruit loopy. Yeah. Should you be driving when you're like that? No. Yeah. No. So we don't drink alkaline water that some of them have a pH of 10. You just raised your pH by breathing out like that from 7.40 probably to 7.48, which is still in somewhat normal range. Now imagine if you tip that even higher. Viable range is 7.1 to 7.7. That's viable range, roughly. So if you're feeling fruit loopy with just a little small change from exhaling too much, imagine what your body's going to be like if you drink one of those big really I know. Oh, but it's so good for you. No, it's not. No, it's not. I water you Regular water. <laughs> <laughs> From the tap, in fact. Fluoride. The tap water. Stronger teeth. Okay. We do not. Now, if you want, if you actually want to know the mathematical proof why we should not, you should come to my phys class tonight. Lab, 7 o'clock. That's what they're doing. They, they are going to prove why drinking alkaline water is not your friend. Okay. So, but that is not for you, my young Padawan members. <laughs> We're working on the kidneys. And the lungs and the kidneys both maintain your blood pH. We're going to go and take a trip through the nephron, as I said during this first segment of the video. Have you started your histology in the renal system? Do you see this? Do you see this structure right here with a whole bunch of nuclei? Yeah, we got this. That's the glomerulus. Have you done renal histology? Do you see this white part around it? That's Bowman's capsule. So if I slice through that, I would see the glomerulus inside and then the cells of the capsule around it. Now you should be careful. Be careful. When you actually do this histology, go ahead and get out histology of the, the glomerulus and the renal capsule and get out a microscope, another microscope side by side, put on a slide of the pancreas for the islets of Langerhans because they look dangerously close. Which is why Joyce, when he said, oh, I think we've already done this, I went, I wonder if it looks like the islets of Langerhans to you. Islets of Langerhans will look like this there will not be this space for the capsule around them, and that's the dead giveaway that you are not in the kidney, or sorry, not in the pancreas, you are in the kidney. You can open, we can see the glomerulus, the glomerular capsule, and all both of those together is called the renal corpuscle. 
We have an afferent arterial bringing blood to the glomerulus for the sake of filtration, and a smaller efferent arterial. And on your lab exam, you should be able to identify both of them. They will tag them on the models. The afferent is larger in diameter than the efferent. That's how you would uh, distinguish the two. We already told you about the filtration of the membrane. And we're taking a trip to the nephron. Let me orient you to this. Here's my sad glomerulus, Bowman's capsule. This is the proximal convoluted tubule. I abbreviate it as PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule. This is the descending limb for the loop of Henley. This is the hairpin turn. This is the thin ascending limb. This is the thick ascending limb. This is the distal convoluted tubule. Physiologically, there are two parts. There's an early and a late. But in lab, <coughs> they don't care about that. Here, I don't really care too much about it, except that the early does have different anatomy. And I'm gonna tell you some important anatomy of the early compared to the late. But how they work physiologically is not your responsibility. And it will be when you get to physiology, that's for sure. So the, the loop of Henley, again, has, has four parts, descending limb, hairpin turn, thin ascending limb, thick ascending limb. Loop of Henley is also called the nephron loop. Now the PCT, just to highlight that before I move on, what is the anatomy of the proximal convoluted tubule? The cells that make it up are cuboidal cells. They have a lot of microvilli. This gives them more surface area. Why would they need more surface area? They need more surface area to insert protein channels, protein carriers, so that they can reabsorb the good things from your filtrate that should not go in the toilet, like glucose and amino acids. They also need good surface area so that they can secrete waste products that escaped filtration and should go to the toilet. So in order to move all of these solutes back and forth, they need enough cell membrane surface area for them to do their job. So that is a very distinguishing feature. In lab, there is a very cool model, I'm sure Professor Innes will get out, and it's basically a section through different parts of the nephron, and, she'll, and they're colored differently. She'll say, where are we, where are we, where are we, where are we? And you're going to look at it and say, it's circles with cells. I have no idea. But if you look at the shape of the cells and you look at the side of the cells facing the lumen, you'll see microvilli on the ones that are the proximal convoluted tubule circles, representing you going like a cut, a transverse section through them. So that's the PCT. Anywhere where something is called thin, it's simple squamous epithelium. So the descending limb is simple squamous epithelium. The hairpin turn is also simple squamous epithelium. The thin ascending limb is also simple squamous epithelium. When we get to the thick, guess what kind of epithelium we come back to? Cuboidal. And it's cuboidal all the way through the late distal, all, through the distal convoluted tubule, collecting tubules, connecting ducts, collecting ducts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in the PCT, we have reabsorption and secretion. In the descending limb, we have water reabsorption. A question you can expect on your lab exam, they'll tag somewhere on the nephron or give you a list of structures of the nephron. And they will ask you two questions, potentially. Where would you find filtrate that is most like blood? And where would you find filtrate that is most like urine? And the answer will be whatever structures they give you, the closer you are to the glomerulus, the more the filtrate is like blood. 
further away you are from the glomerulus, the more urine-like the filtrate is, least like blood, more like urine. So be ready for those two types of questions. There are some models that we have in the lab that correctly show a nephron. In books, in books, they show this 2D structure. That's very simple and easy. We start here at the glomerulus, we finish over here. But that's not how the nephron is in real life. It's twisted around itself. It's a 3D structure, not ironed out like a 2D structure that we see in the book. So you're gonna wanna make sure on some of those models you start by finding Bowman's capsule and then trace the nephron with your finger. What is the structure right off of Bowman's capsule? Proximal convoluted tubule. Then follow with your finger to the descending limb, to the hairpin turn, to the thin ascending limb, to the thick, to the distal convoluted tubule. Follow it. Don't be myopic on whatever is tagged or pinned. If you walk up to the model and you're like, is that proximal or distal convoluted tubule? Then step back, find your, your Bowman's capsule, glomerular capsule, and trace it. Trace it with your finger. Don't just focus on whatever that tape is on. Go back, find your landmark, and then go through the parts of your nephron. Okay. So the descending limb of the loop of Henle is going to be focused on reabsorbing water. By the time the filter gets down to the hair filter, what would it taste like? Concentrated. Concentrated and salty. How can you make a solution more concentrated? Yeah. You can add solute or you can remove water. Right? Those are your two options. The descending limb does both. It removes water and it adds solute. So by the time your filtrate gets down to the bottom, it's as maximally concentrated as you can make it. The maximum we can concentrate our filtrate is four times as concentrated as our blood. That's it. The reason why that's it for us is because most of our nephrons are those portable nephrons with short loops of Henle. If we had more longer loops of Henle, we'd be able to concentrate our filter form. More opportunity to suck out water and add salt. But we don't have the majority of our nephrons being just hydrogenated. So four times the saltiness of our blood. Our blood has a saltiness of 300. There are units with this. I'm not going to bore you with the units. That's physiology. This 300 is your blood. 1,200 is how much you can concentrate your urine. So if you were drinking your filtrate, it'd be very much like blood here in the PCT. Then by the time we get to the hairpin turn, it would be extremely salty, four times as salty. And then as we go up the thin descending limb, just basically a continuation of the hair could turn. When we get to the thick, we're going to see solutes taken out. No water, solutes. And how can you make a solution dilute? Add water or take out the solutes. So the thick ascending limb is called the diluting segment, not because it adds water. It has, it has nothing to do with water. It removes solutes. So by the time your filtrate gets up here, it has a saltiness factor of 100. We went from 1,200 to 100. That's a very hard working part of your nephron. Very hard working. Very hard. Burns a lot of ATP. Matched by a gram, the kidneys consume more ATP than any other organ in your body. And it comes down to that part. That's it's phenomenal. You gotta take care of your kidneys. Gotta drink a lot of water. By the time the filtrate goes through the distal convoluted tubule, it can come out to be about 50 compared to blood. It's extremely dilute. 
course, that depends on how well hydrated you are, how much salt you've eaten in your diet. So those are just some typical numbers. But they can change based on your hydration and your salt intake. Your kidney's job is to regulate how much water you pee out, how much water you save, how much salt you pee out, how much salt you save. And they have to make this adjustment based on your intake. Based on what you take in, that's what they dictate goes out. Does that make sense? So the, di the distal convoluted tubule, there is a part of it that I said has very unique anatomy. The nephron is not a 2D structure that, like you're seeing on the board. It's twisted on itself, much like you taking a rubber band and kind of twisting it around itself. And if you, if you just use your fingers, use your fingers like this, Let's say your index finger is your afferent arterial, your middle finger is your efferent arterial, and your hand is the glomerulus. Okay, so blood's coming in, filtration, blood leaving. These two arterials straddle the distal convoluted tubule, the early part, this part right here. They straddle it, so they straddle. There's a functional contact. That functional contact does a lot. It is important, and we go after it clinically every day. So you knowing that anatomy of that functional contact is important. Because when you get to phys, it's like, you all know the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Anatomy is a prereq. The juxtaglomerular apparatus consists of the afferent, efferent arterial, the early distal convoluted tubule, there it is, cut in half like a transverse section. There are special cells inside that early distal convoluted tubule. They are called macula densa cells. And I'm going to tell you what they do. I'm going to tell you what they do. I'm going to show you a video so you remember what they do. And it's not a video on kidneys. Mm -mm. It's an analogy. I think you're going to remember. In between the afferent and efferent arterial and the early distal convoluted tubule, you see these cells right here? Those cells, well, there, there are a couple different ones there. There are mesangial cells. Don't worry about those. And there are juxtaglomerular cells. They are mostly found around the afferent arterial, but there are some found around the efferent as well. The juxtaglomerular cells and the macula densa cells are in constant chemical communication with each other. Much how neurons signal, they release, they don't release neurotransmitters, but they release chemical signals. This apparatus, the afferent, efferent arterial, early distal convoluted tubule, juxtaglomerular cells, macula densa cells, hugely important. Don't mess with them. <laughs> Don't mess with them. They will release the hounds of hell in your body. That functional contact will change everything in your body just to make sure the nephron can do its job. You see, there are different kinds of renal failure. There's pre-renal failure, there's intra-renal failure, and there's post-renal failure. And it matters what kind of renal failure you have because it dictates how we help you clinically. If you have intrarenal failure, well, we're looking at a kidney transplant. But if you have pre-renal failure, you don't need a kidney transplant. We got to figure out what's going wrong with your cardiovascular system. Maybe your heart is weak as a pump and is it pushing the blood to the kidneys? If the kidneys don't get blood, how do they filter it? They don't. So if they don't filter your blood, that's renal failure. And if the kidneys could talk to you, they'd say, but it's not our fault. We're fine. We want to do our job. You're just not getting blood to us. 
and that apparatus will rain hell on everywhere else in the body just so the nephron can do its job. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. How many of you have high blood pressure? Medicated. Gold standard for starting high blood pressure medication is a drug called lisinopril. It is called an ACE inhibitor, and that drug blocks that apparatus so it can't rain hell on everywhere else in your body. Your kidneys will drive your blood pressure through the roof just to make sure they get enough blood going to the glomerulus so they can filter it. And it's their own undoing. They're going to cause renal failure ultimately because you're going to destroy the glomerulus infiltration membrane with those pressures. So we got we got to rein that in. That's not good to have chronically high blood pressure, and that's probably the cause. So you need to know the anatomy of that structure. In phys, you learn how it works and how it rains hell on the body if it doesn't get its way. It's really important. Afferent arterial, efferent arterial, macula densa cells within the early distal convoluted tubule, juxtaglomerular cells around the afferent arterial and a little bit around the efferent arterial. Mesangial cells, they are there too. We won't even entertain them. Well, they're fun, but I don't teach about them until path of this because they're complicated. Okay, so all this talk of pee, I'm sure you have to go. So go pee. Come back in about 10 minutes.